With the Lucky Land Slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. This is your captain speaking. Uh, we've got clear runway and the weather's fine, but we're just going to circle up here a while and uh, get lucky. No, no, nothing like that. It's just these cash prizes add up quick. So I suggest you sit back, keep your tray table upright, and start getting lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Hi everyone, I'm Deb Flaschenberg. Welcome to Yoga Birth Babies, a podcast produced by Prenatal Yoga Center. We will be diving into everything prenatal yoga, birth, and baby related, hoping to inspire, educate, and empower you through your journey into motherhood. Thank you for listening. Hi, I'm Deb Flaschenberg. I'm your host for Yoga Birth Babies. And today we hear a community birth story. We have Jen Gross who started with PYC when she was about 12 weeks pregnant pre-COVID. And we worked together in the studio and then we went online doing everything virtually. And I saw her all the way up until she had her baby. And Jen came on to Yoga Birth Babies and shared her story. And what I loved about it is she shares such a positive birth story. It's so common that that pregnant people are magnets to birth stories that are traumatic or negative in some manner. And what Jen shares is a really positive story. So I hope you enjoyed it because it's nice to hear a story where someone comes out feeling like giving birth was their superpower, where they embodied the experience, they took it and they worked with their body and their baby and they had just an amazing experience. So please enjoy this. Jen gives some fantastic recounts of it and what helped her prepare and how she was able to really trust her body. So stay tuned for that. Before we get to that, I just want to say thank you to everyone that has left a rating and review for the podcast. It helps people find us. And if you haven't done that yet, please take a moment to go do so, as well as just an honoring to our community for how it's grown. Just this week, I like to look at the waivers as they come in. I know it's a little crazy, but I like to look at the waivers and see where people are tuning in from. And just this week, we had somebody tune in from California. We also then had someone tune in from Guatemala. I'm like, woohoo, we are really international. And it's really amazing to think that we have busted through the walls of New York City because honestly, I don't know when we're going to be back there. So keep jumping in, keep listening to, keep coming into class, keep listening to the podcast please continue to support PYC. Tell a friend about us. And then the last thing I just want to share is that teacher training for the early fall has started. They already have their membership website. They're jumping into it. And we're starting our November, December one very soon. There's still about two spots left for that. And then we're plowing ahead and we're going to be doing it January, February. So if you are interested in an 85 hour teacher training, prenatal yoga teacher training, something we take very seriously, it's a very intense course, check that out. Okay. We're going to take a super quick break and we come back. Please enjoy my conversation with Jen. Hey guys, it is Ryan. I'm not sure if you know this about me, but I'm a bit of a fun fanatic when I can. I like to work, but I like fun too. It's a thing. And now the truth is out there. I can tell you about my favorite place to have fun. Chumba Casino. They have hundreds of social casino style games to choose from with new games released each week. You can play for free anytime, anywhere. And each day brings a new chance to collect daily bonuses. So join me in the fun. Sign up now at ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. BGW. Void or prohibited by law. See terms and conditions. 18 plus. Hi, Jen. How are you? Hi, Deb. I'm doing well. How are you? I am doing great. I am so excited to hear about your birth. So I guess let's give a little context to the community. Jen started with us. You were in your first trimester, right? I I was. I think I was just at 12 weeks. I loved it. And then you were with us since before all this COVID, which is crazy to kind of think about life before then. And I got to watch you go through the majority of your pregnancy. So it is such a joy to chat with you and to hear about your birth story. So before we jump into that, I feel like I know you a bit, but why don't you tell the community about yourself? Okay. Um, 
actually, it feels quite funny to be talking about myself having just given birth because I feel that most of the questions I receive are about my son. <laughs> um, so yes, my husband and I, we gave birth about 10 weeks ago to our son, Russell. Um, and my professional background, if, if that's of interest, sure. is, has always been focused on healthcare, um, really across business development and account management in the pharma and biotech sector, and then also um, within the startup sector and med tech and health tech. So we lived on the Upper East Side of Manhattan until this past March. Um, and at the time, I was at the end of my second trimester or entering my third trimester, and we decided to seek shelter in New Jersey uh, at my in-laws while they are in Florida. And we have been here ever since. And actually, we are now becoming New Jersey re- residents. So are you? Welcome to New Jersey. Quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Wait, but isn't that like a plus 55 community? Are you moving out of that since you're not? Oh, we are 100% moving out. Yes, this is still <laughs> my in-laws home and, and they will be here um, in the summertime moving forward. Uh and honestly, they'll be very close to their first grandson, which I think is, is really exciting for them and exciting for us. A little extra help from a child care perspective. Absolutely. So let's, I know that you made some big choices and big decisions when you, first of all, you left Manhattan, you left a practice you were with, and then you ended up in New Jersey, but your vision and your birth plan also changed. Can you talk a little bit about how did your plans change and your also, as well as your approach to preparing for birth and the birth that you start to envision? Yeah, it's true. A lot changed. Um, and a lot changed, not necessarily by choice, but I, I will say the birth ended up being really beautiful. Um, truthfully, I, I didn't really have a birth plan beyond the idea of, of wanting to get pregnant. Um, And once we did, my husband and I decided, you know, we wanted this to be a really conscious experience. And I ended up actually taking some time off from work uh, just to really enjoy the pregnancy um, to its fullest. So that seemed really special and and, and was really special. Um, And during that process, I would say at some, some, some point between the first and second trimester, I decided that I wanted the birth itself to be as conscious as possible. And I wanted to prepare, um, for an unmedicated birth. And, you know, it's funny because I'm, I'm not one to, to be so adamant (laughs) about, um, something like this. I, I, I can't even think of another example in my life where I've felt so strongly, but it, something came over me. I don't know, maybe it was my son. And I, it just told me, you should try to do this without medication if you can. Um, and so that was the, the path that we pursued. So when you were in the city, did you have, what kind of care were you, were you seeking or what kind of care did you have? Okay. So that's, um, <laughs> a great question. Our birth plan in that regard actually changed three times. <laughs> I was supposed to give birth at Mount Sinai East. Um, and as I had progressed with my care there, just discussions about things that were starting to, to make me uncomfortable were coming to fruition. I think one of which was um, the need for an induction if I went beyond 40 weeks. And being that it's my first pregnancy, that would be very possible. Um, and so I thought, you know what, let me just see if there are any alternative options out there. And I ended up finding village maternity, which is a worth and Musali practice. They're amazing. Um, yeah, they really are. I think they're They're very special shining stars in the obstetrics community. Yep. And they have a partnership with metropolitan hospital, um, a public hospital in New York city. Uh, and Michael and I had planned to give birth there. And um, being from New York City originally, you know, the thought of giving birth at Metropolitan Hospital was just kind of shocking. It, it didn't seem like a hospital that, that I would um, normally choose, you know, to, to give birth at. But I, we did a tour of the hospital and it was extraordinary. I mean, the labor and delivery unit was incredible. Not only did everyone have a private room, no matter what, but it was just... Um, 
was really focused on the mom and her experience and the midwife um, and or doctor needed being there in support of you. Mm -hmm. So that was the second shift. Um, And then COVID happened and we made the, what was supposed to be a temporary move to New Jersey and is now no longer a temporary move. Um, And around 33 weeks, I had to once again change my um, practitioner and we found the Avalon midwifery practice in Morristown. Um, and they are associated with both Morristown hospital and our birthing center. And because COVID was so rampant at the time, Michael and I thought, uh, a birthing center would probably be the absolute best option. And, and actually we were the only people at the birthing center during our birth. It was us and our midwife. That is so nice to really have the space to do and move and just do what your body needs. It's a lot of change. Like if you looked at that trajectory from more of a, you know, Mount Sinai East is pretty traditional to the metropolitan and, and, you know, with the midwives and Worth Musali to a birth center. That's a, that's a big arc. Indeed. And I was in denial for a long time about needing to change my practitioner in my third trimester, I thought for sure we would end up back in New York City and the birth would go exactly as we had planned at Metropolitan. And, you know, with every week we were getting closer to the birth and COVID wasn't going away. (laughs) And I think it was my husband that said, you know, realistically, we need a plan B and and we just went into action. And honestly, I, I don't think it could have been a more seamless experience here in New Jersey that the practice was just wonderful. I was cared for by like a wonderful group of women. I met most of the midwives there. And then the birthing center was just the perfect place to, to have this unmedicated birth and, um, really to experience birth in ways that I hadn't even imagined, um, that would be possible. Um, you know, things we maybe have brought up in yoga class, like, you know, hands and knees, um, using the birth ball, really making a lot of sounds. I mean, it all came to fruition. It was pretty wild. <laughs> oh, I'm, I look forward. I really do want to dive into your birth story, but I also want to just pick a little bit at your brain because you know you we you were pregnant kind of at the start of COVID and and things changed. So when you were heading into being pregnant, this wasn't something on your radar. So what was it like? being pregnant during this, I mean, you were, you know, you were pregnant during that, the kind of the lockdown in April and kind of trudged your way through mentally. What was that like for you? Um, you know, now looking back on it, there was a really high level of anxiety, um, just going up and down in the elevator and, um, being and living so close to Mount Sinai East I don't know that I would have had as peaceful a pregnancy if we hadn't um, made the move to New Jersey at the time that we did. Um, but I will say, you know, probably the, the the most unsettling thing was when the regulations came out that there could only be um, the delivering person in the room as well as the the healthcare provider. Mm -hmm. Um, and so the thought of not having my husband by my side and not having my doula by my side, um, was really startling. And I just feel grateful, uh, that 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 changed by the time that I gave birth and also grateful that I was in a setting like the birthing center that not only allowed both my husband and my doula to be there, but really allowed them to be front and center in the birth experience. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it was, um, it wasn't ideal, but I will also say that there was a silver lining there because there was nowhere for me to go, right? Being that COVID was, was so rampant during a good portion of my pregnancy. Um, and it just allowed me to have a lot of time for myself with my baby. And I think the two of us are, are perhaps more connected because of that. Yeah. And you really were able to put the time in. You came to class a lot. You really committed to, and you know what I really also, I respected a lot. 
you really listen to your body. Like there would be, t- which is often a theme in our class. Let's face it. I mean, that's, I'm always like, listen to your body, listen to your body. But you took that invitation and really went with it. Like there was times where, like my body was telling me not to do this. My, you know, I felt like the, you started to have a deeper conversation and I could, wa- I could witness that happening. I remember there's one time you were saying, and it's still stuck in my, my mind. You're like, my tongue was glued to the roof of my mouth. And that was a sign that this was stressing me out or tensing me up. And I wasn't going to do it. Like that takes some deep listening and observation and it, it's nice that you were able to to do that during that time. And I will say that exact feeling uh, resurfaces during the birth. You, if you're really listening to yourself, you know what to do and what not to do. And there were many of positions that I tried that I realized, you know what, this isn't right, and and we just shifted. That's fantastic, and that's exactly why we have these conversations in class about really learning to have that internal conversation with yourself because it's such a kind of a buzzword. Listen to yourself, listen to your inner voice. But if you've never had that conversation, if you've never took the time to have that relationship with your own body, it's hard to know what to do. It's hard to suddenly turn it on and be like, yeah, this is what I want to do. If it's a, if, if the two, the mind and body have not been connected. So I'd love to hear a little bit. And I, I feel like I know it's a little bit, but for share with the community, what helped you mentally and physically prepare for birth and for parenthood? I'm still preparing. (laughs) So Um, am I nine years later? (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Fair enough. Um, well, yoga was obviously a big part of my preparation for birth. Uh, and I did. I took the classes very seriously. It wasn't just an opportunity to stretch my body in ways that felt safe. Um, it was also an opportunity to really learn about the parts of my body that I would be using during birth and um, the best way to access uh, the power I needed in order to birth effectively. So, um, we talked a lot about laboring positions and I really use those. Um, and I really found the positions that felt right. We, we, we talked a lot about, um, our transverse abdominis and, you know, pushing power and you know, that all really came in handy as well. I, I, yoga was absolutely, I would say at the, the top of the list in terms of, um, preparation for my birth, but, there were also some other things I did. I did a hypnobirthing class, which uh, was, I think, really relaxing, just put me into a, a very relaxed state of mind going into the birth. Uh, and I also read a lot of birth stories, positive birth stories, mm-hmm. um, women who had birthed all over the world in all different settings, um, you know, surrounded by all different types of people. And it was just wonderful to do internalize their stories and know that, uh, I'm really just one of many women (laughs) that is giving birth and our bodies know exactly what to do. We've been doing this for eons, if Mm -hmm. you will. I like, I love that you did that. There's actually research saying that when you hear positive birth stories, it makes you more calm or not makes, but it can invite you to be more confident going into yours because oftentimes people want to share their birth stories that may not have been. And that's really rarely about the pregnant person, more about the person just kind of still processing. But when you, when our society shares the negative, it can really, uh, erode our confidence. So I'm glad to hear that. And I love that you also focused on the one in many, because it's true and it can give that sense of community. Like I am one of many, we can do this. We have done this. We will continue to do that. All right. So we're going to take a quick break and we come back. I want to hear your whole story. All right. We'll take a super quick break. We'll be right back. Waiting on a tax return. Hopefully it ends up in your hands. Fraudulent tax returns due to identity theft increased by 30% in 2023. If you're in a bind this tax season, LifeLock can help. Our U.S.-based restoration specialists are experts dedicated to helping solve your identity theft issues. And all LifeLock plans are backed by the Million Dollar Protection Package. So we'll reimburse you up to the limits of your plan if you lose money due to identity theft. Help protect your information this tax season with LifeLock. Save up to 25% your first year at LifeLock.com slash aware. With Lucky Land Slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. 
This is your captain speaking. Uh, we've got clear runway and the weather's fine, but we're just gonna circle up here a while and uh, get lucky. No, no, nothing like that. It's just these cash prizes add up quick. So I suggest you sit back, keep your tray table upright, and start getting lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandslots.com. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. All right, let's dive in. I want to hear a birth story. Okay. Um, (laughs) I woke up the morning of the 28th of June. And I hope this isn't an overshare, but like many of mornings, I thought, okay, pelvic floor, not as intact as it normally is. (laughs) I just want to change these pajamas and go back to bed. Um, and so that was what I did. <laughs> and little did I know that I either had a slow leak um, or my water had broken. Um, you know, to this day, that's that's still kind of a funny thing that I, <laughs> I didn't realize my water had broken when it had. Um, and a few hours later, I remember, um, you know, go, just doing my morning work in the bathroom and realizing that, oh, my gosh, this might be my mucus plug. Um and it just felt like more blood than than I thought would be present for a mucus plug. And I called my midwife and I sent a picture. And she she played it safe. She actually asked me to go to Morristown Hospital to be checked out. And I remember thinking in that moment that I had really screwed up and I shouldn't have sent that picture because I didn't feel as if I were unsafe. In that moment in time, I actually felt really comfortable. I felt really confident that either I was going to go into labor soon um, or that it would happen, you know, within the week. Because I know sometimes you can lose your mucus plug and um, the body doesn't go into labor uh, immediately. But I went to the hospital um, and respected her wishes. And on the way to the hospital... I was experiencing something again. This was my, my first birth. So I, I thought, well, maybe this is Braxton Hicks. Maybe this is just some discomfort. I, I don't know what this is, but turns out they were contractions. And by the time, um, I was checked out at the hospital, I was, it was actually quite funny because I remember the nurse looking at me and saying, okay, on a scale of one to 10, how much pain are you in? And I remember thinking, oh, what a ridiculous question. Why are you encouraging me to feel pain? And I said, hmm, I don't know, maybe a two. She said, okay, well, you are five and a half centimeters dilated and moving into active labor. And I looked at her like, are you crazy? Are you serious? <laughs> um, and then it was really full speed ahead from there. I, I was adamant about wanting to give birth at the birthing center and, and not to stay at the hospital. So um, my husband and I packed up and we were on our way to the car. And then there's that infamous video in the, the parking garage yes. where I just had like a monstrous contraction. All right, talk about that. Like... Talk about that. Cause I, w- then please send that to me again so I can include this in the show notes. But, um, okay. was that on your way to the car or was that from the car to the birth center? That was actually in the hospital parking lot. Okay. <laughs> so we weren't even on our way to the birth center yet. And this is how um, (laughs) naive we are. Michael and I actually thought, well, let's go home first. We'll pack a few more things and then we'll head to the birthing center. By the way, we lasted about two minutes in the car and I said, turn around and go to the birthing center now. We're having our baby. Um, But so we walked out of the hospital um, and we're heading to our car. And all of a sudden, um, this just monstrous surge hit me and Oh, I just sort of, I remember just leaning into it and rotating my hips and kind of opening my mouth and the sounds just came out on their own. These were not sounds that I even knew <laughs> I could make. They were, I guess I would describe them as primordial. I have no idea, but, uh, boy, it got me through it. Like it was nothing. And a lot of people see that video and ask, was that for real? And I'm like, yeah, I was at least six centimeters dilated at that point. Because as soon as the surge ended, I looked up at my husband and I'm like, okay, we're good. Let's keep going. (laughs) Um, and I think that was also just, you know, the, the, the power of open throat, uh, 
uh, moving the body Mm -hmm. and also the mind, you know, it was a lot like doing, um, three chair poses in a row in your yoga class. Right. Um, so yeah, that was, that was definitely a, a highlight of, uh, the early birth experience. So we got in the car and again, we thought we were going to head home and then head to the birth center. That was certainly not the case. Um, within about five minutes, I told Michael, turn around, go go to the directly to the birth center. And he looked at me and said, but it's closed. And I'm like, okay, well, we need to call the midwives to get it open. And by the time I got to the birthing center, they were opening the center for me. So again, we were the only uh, family there, which was really lovely. Um, they started filling the tub. I, I actually got on my hands and knees upon getting into the room. Um, and I was just, uh, doing a lot of cat cow, doing a lot of rolling of my hips, um, using the birth ball a bit. And, um, all of a sudden I realized I needed to get into the tub and I, I did. And I wouldn't say that my labor slowed down by the time we got into the tub because it was, it was very intense. Um, but for some reason I almost had more time to reflect when I got into the tub in between each surge. I I really had just a conscious moment, um, to move my body in, in ways that I I thought were important. Like I just felt that the left side of my pelvis needed to be more open. And I went into kind of a half squat, Mm -hmm. which was really, really helpful. Um, and this is also pretty funny. I have an amazing doula, Bailey Rollins, who I met in Manhattan and she had planned to be by my side at Metropolitan Hospital. Uh, we Ubered her, uh, to the birthing center and she was on FaceTime with me the entire time that I was in that tub. I was sure she would not make it for the birth. She arrived and in about 30 minutes thereafter her arrival, I gave birth. The, the whole thing, and sometimes I don't like saying this out loud because I, I did get a, a funny reaction from uh, one of the neighbors in the 55 and older community, but the, the whole birthing experience, by the time I had arrived at the hospital to the time that Russell was born, it was really, it was like almost three hours. That that was it, but it That's felt like a amazing. lot longer. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. It really did feel like a lot longer though. I <laughs> I have it on video and well, I, I three intense it. hours. It, it really was. I but, rewatched the experience in preparation for this call. And uh there was one point that I looked up at, at my midwife and I said, Why is he taking so long to come out? And she's <laughs> like, Honey, he's not <laughs> So yeah, I guess that there was a little bit of a warped um time perspective there. That's actually one of the things I loved about birth when I was a doula is that there is a very warped sense. As the birthing person, it may feel forever. As the person just didn't experience it, actually I've often felt very quick. But I, I can respect the other side because I wasn't feeling it. So <laughs> I get what you were yes. feeling is different than the observer who's really present in the moment. That's amazing. So and one thing I don't yeah. Yeah, sure. One thing I don't want to do is I, I, I don't want anyone to think that I had this perfect water birth that was just so peaceful and, and there were no, um, uh, unforeseen along the way. Um, actually towards the end of my birth, as Russell was crowning, I didn't realize I had to stay in the water and I actually stood up mm. and I exposed, blood pressure. Um, <laughs> yes, I exposed him to oxygen. And at that point, uh, I had to kind of get out of the tub in an emergency fashion. And I, um, I ended up not giving birth in the water. I ended up giving birth kind of leaned over the bed. Mm. Um, and at that point he came out right away, but, uh, yeah, that definitely wasn't, you know, a part of the plan. And just in the moment, somehow my, my body encouraged me to stand up and I did, and we had to sort of shift direction. So there were some twists and turns. It really does sound like it was, things were well aligned. And so we'll just take a small little path of deviation just to talk about that, that you put in grant, we don't really know what, how and why it was so nice and quick, but you did put a lot of work into, and you took it seriously, the yoga practice and the work. And when we can align the baby and the pelvis and the soft tissues, things can work really functionally. And you 
did put that effort in. So who knows if that's why, you know, we never know. Um, but you, you really did commit to setting yourself up for as much success as possible and your body really reacted beautifully and your baby obviously reacted beautifully, rotating, descending out so well. So talk a little bit more. And I use those of, yeah. spinning baby poses that, that you, um, that you had taught us. Oh, I, I did those outside of class too. Um, and I think that was particularly helpful. The forward leading, the forward leading inversion. inversion. Yeah. That's why I had actually a student ask, was like, why do you keep doing that in every single class? I'm like, cause I think it helps. I think it really, it really can help align the soft tissue, the cervix. And when a baby's well positioned against the cervix and the uterus is working functionally, that's when all the cogs are working together and things can happen. So, and I knew you took it very seriously. I knew you did the work. Um, I'd love to hear more about, so you talked about the open throat. So talk a little bit about the techniques and tools that you gravitated towards. Um, I, I'll, I'll tell you what, what I struggled with first, okay, which, sure. which was the breathing. I don't know why. As soon as I started counting my breath, um, inhaling and exhaling, I, I seemed to just get caught up in how long the breath was and it, it became like a stressful experience for me. So I didn't do a lot of breathing work during the birth itself, which I know by the way, works for so many women it just didn't seem to work for me. I did a lot more um, visual work. So uh, just imagining myself meeting our son, um, picturing myself in an environment that I feel really peaceful, remembering um, what it would feel like to be in that environment, uh, and also listening to some of the meditations from hypnobirthing, which, which for me worked. That's great. I actually, I, I like that. I like the meditations. I, and we know we've done some of the breathing work in our, in our prenatal class from the hypnobirthing. And I also wanted to say one thing about the visualizations. So in the past, I was kind of like, do they work? Do they not? And as I've talked to you a little bit about, so, and, and the listeners may not know this yet. So last week, my son broke his elbow quite badly and he was having a really hard time falling asleep. He was so uncomfortable. And so I pulled out visualizations. I've actually dug deep into my doula mind and I used a lot of the coping skills that we do in class and I did it with him and I created a really, I knew his kind of happy space is the beach, my happy space too. And I talked him through it. And that's one thing I don't do visualizations in class because I think it's so personal and I wouldn't want to be like, okay, we're walking on the beach. And then someone would be like, oh my God, I must die to the beach. It's not my happy spot. But I think there's a lot of power in visualizations. It can make you feel safe. It can make you feel grounded. If someone you love is reading the script of it or talking you through it, it can really be a great connection. And if you're doing it within your own mind, it can really ease your body. So I'm glad that you brought that up because I do think they're extremely powerful. It worked for me. I'm really glad to hear that. What was something that was surprising for you about the experience? Oh gosh. Well, um, the whole experience actually was surprising as, as much as I was prepared, it was beyond my wildest dreams. But the most surprising thing was not realizing my water had, had broken. <laughs> I was just so sure that I, I would know exactly when I was going into labor and then the signs of, of pre-labor. And truthfully, that was a hundred percent, not the case. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes I actually thought that I remember thinking like, I think my water broke and then, and then my midwife's like, nope, it's just fluid. And then the other side when it broke, I'm like, no, it's just fluid. She's like, no, your water broke. So yeah, <laughs> <laughs> as much as we think we know our bodies, sometimes it's still like surprise. Yeah. So as your son grows up, what would be something you'd want to share with him about his birth? I love passing these stories down to our kids. That's a good question. And I spent a lot of time pregnant, you know, talking to him, rubbing my belly, um, just having little traditions of things I said, things we would experience together throughout the day. Um, and, and I repeated them frequently, you know, thinking that these are things he'll, he'll understand and remember when he's born. And, you know, so far, 
<laughs> when I repeat some of these sayings or sing to him in the way that I, I had, I don't always get a reaction from him. And so, um, I just want to let him know, uh, just the amount of work and connection that I, I felt with him, um, when he was in my tummy and, you know, a whole different type of connection that, that we have and, and bonding experience that we're creating, uh, now that he's here in the world. That's great. So before, I know you did a lot of yoga, but was it, what else helped you trust your body? Cause I think that can be a challenge for people to really get outside the thinking mind and go deeper into, I trust that my body knows how to do this. I think it's again, kind of a buzzword and be like, yeah, I can do that. But it takes a certain commitment to get there. What helped you with that? Yeah. I I actually sometimes ask myself, you know, why was I so sure that I could do this without any type of intervention, um, especially the first time around and not really knowing exactly what to expect. Um, it was just this, this feeling of deep knowing internally. It was like visceral that uh, my body had, had it under control and that my son was going to do whatever he needed to, to, to enter the world safely. Um, I would, I would say, you know, in addition to, to being very aware of my body, um, not only through yoga, but, um, also probably reading other people's birth stories and hearing about all of these successful and beautiful births that had happened in different parts of the world and under very different circumstances that I just felt like one of many, you know, there wasn't enough time for me to be fearful. It was Mm -hmm. just another birth and there were probably a many, many births happening simultaneously to mine. Mm, I like that idea of that connection. What's something you wish someone had told you that you want to share with others? So I was told this and I, I, I took it seriously, but I wish I had done more. Um, when we talked about the transverse of Dominus and, um, you know, like the, the pushing, the way to, to kind of push and really use your abs. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I thought I got enough from class, especially being that I had such a connection to my abs prior to pregnancy. Um, I was so sure that, you know, that power would just sort of (laughs) make its way into the birth experience. And, uh, truthfully, I, I wish that I had spent a little more time, um, not just practicing, the breathing, but maybe doing, um, one of your courses on pushing power, Mm. uh, because I don't know that I used my pushing power as effectively as I could. Look, I had a a very smooth birth. Um, and I'm not saying that it should have been shorter than it was. It's just, (laughs) it, uh, it maybe wasn't as efficient as it could have been. I'm going to invite you to give yourself a little slack on that because I, I pushed my son out for hours and I walked in, this is what I teach. And I walked in thinking, I'm like, I know how to do this. But for some, I'd say a lot of people, it's a new, it's a new task being asked. And we're trying to coordinate the, like your uterus giving you this feedback. Your uterus is literally pushing your baby out and then using your core. So I bet you did amazingly well with it. Um, but just to try to coordinate what you're supposed to do in the moment. So I'm just inviting you to not be so hard on yourself, but I bet you did a great job. Well, thank you. I will say, um, in rewatching the videos and I I don't know that I picked up on this and it's during the birth itself, but one of the midwives said to me, um, you know, <laughs> really to, to, to push down, <laughs> really push down. And I'm like, I thought that I was. Um, so there must have been something that, that, that I was doing that she felt, um, you know, could have been amplified. But anyway, it was what it was and it was wonderful. I'm so glad. So let's talk about postpartum. Can you share a little bit about these last 10 weeks? Yes. I, after the birth, I remember feeling like, okay, that was pretty badass. That was an awesome birth experience. Um, and I came home the same night that we gave birth to my son. We actually had a conversation with one of our neighbors. <laughs> He's like, wait, I'm like, yes. Um, and I remember thinking, well, I'm, I'm back to my normal self, you know, it's all good. And I was going up and down the stairs and, um, 
making food and doing laundry. And I would say about a week in, it just hit me like a ton of bricks. Like, wow, I am not healing. I don't feel healed. Um, I was probably more exhausted than I needed to be. Um, and that was when I kind of took a step back and really, uh, tried to embrace postpartum in in a, in a different way than I had, um, which was more about just relaxing, um, and feeding the baby on demand. Mm -hmm. And so that was what the subsequent weeks looked like. Um, and if, you know, if, if I could change one thing or, or give up a piece of advice, you know, really take that healing time seriously, because I'm 10 weeks now. And while I think a lot of my body has healed, um, there's definitely still some, some healing to go. And I'm just, um, being compassionate with myself about that. Yeah. You can, it's easy to fall into the adrenaline rush right after baby's born yes. and kind of fly with that and then crash. So again, don't be so hard on yourself because that's a very common experience, especially when you do come out of a birth experience feeling really empowered, like in this, you know, just so great about it that you're just kind of flying on it. Um, but then the demands of being a new parent, the feeding, especially feeding on demand, uh, finding your way as this new role and the responsibility and, and all the huge work that a newborn requires. So I can imagine that, that downside. And it's great that you're starting to, I'm well, not even starting that you have been honoring the healing process. And it's not uncommon that when we do push ourselves too much in the beginning, that it could take a few steps back on the healing, but I'm glad to hear that you're, you're our healing. What are you doing to support giving yourself this time? Do you have extra help? Or are you just reminding yourself you soon can be more active and that it was all that work will all that activity can still be there. What helps you kind of step back and relax a little bit more? Well, one thing that has been really helpful is, um, my pelvic floor physical therapist. Um, Yay, I, PTs. yeah, I got her name through, um, the Avalon midwife center and she did a lot of home visits, um, with me for the first two months, not because there was any dire need for it, but because I wanted to, you know, refocus on alignment and, um, just kind of tell, show and give my body, um, the time and support it needed. Um, and it was just, it's a really gentle approach. Um, but it, it also helped me to, to feel portions of my body that Mm. maybe I wasn't able to tap into, um, during my pregnancy or after the birth, just, you know, muscles that hadn't been used, et cetera. So I think that has been monumentally, uh, supportive in, the postpartum experience. I'm so glad you had that chance to do that. It is definitely something that I think a lot of people don't know to do or don't have the resources to do. It's unfortunate that our healthcare, I mean, I can go down a deep, a deep rabbit hole about this, that our healthcare doesn't support that for everybody because the pelvic floor often goes through some sort of ordeal, some sort of trauma to birth. And then to have someone reteach you those muscles, it's, it's really important because everyone deserves a healthy pelvic floor. And Anything how connected wanted, the yeah. pelvic floor is just to other parts of your body. I mean, yeah. Um, Lower back. Yeah, Dr. So Kircher much. at one point, yes, she, she realigned something and all of a sudden I, I felt as if my, my neck was just straighter. <laughs> it was extraordinary. Yeah. Um, how's the, if you don't mind me asking, I know that you've chosen to breastfeed. How is that going? Deb, that was not easy at first. Um, it was really challenging to get the latch right. Not because I didn't know what a good latch looked like. And I had done a lot of prep in terms of breastfeeding classes, but, um, Russell had a tongue tie and he was mm-hmm. also born at 37 weeks. So, you know, his dexterity coupled with the tongue tie made it painful for me and also sometimes a frustrating experience for him. So mm. it took a while to get into a groove there. Um, and it actually also took renting um, a hospital grade pump, which 
by the way, when people told me, oh, I rented a hospital grade pump, I'm thinking it's this monstrous thing that, you know, would be hooked into a wall at a hospital. And it's not. <laughs> I mean, it's big enough. My husband did joke like, oh boy, this thing has a seat at the dinner table with us. <laughs> but um, that actually also really helped me and working with a lactation consultant virtually, um, actually pretty much every week. That's good. I'm really glad you guys to hear it. you got on track with that because it can definitely be something frustrating, um, something many people want. And then when you hit bumps, it can be upsetting to everyone. You know, concern is the baby getting enough? Why? Is, and then the baby's crying and then the pain it can actually cause you if the latch isn't good. So I'm glad to hear you got help. All right, we're going to take one more break. And I want when we come back, I want to hear what is one tip or piece of advice you'd like to offer to new or expectant parents, as well as if there's anything else you want to share about your story. We'll be right back. It is Ryan here, and I have a question for you. What do you do when you win? Like, are you a fist pumper? A woohooer, a hand clapper, a high fiver. I kind of like the high five, but if you want to hone in on those winning moves, check out Chumba Casino. At chumbacasino.com, choose from hundreds of social casino style games for your chance to redeem serious cash prizes. There are new game releases weekly, plus free daily bonuses. So don't wait. Start having the most fun ever at chumbacasino.com. No purchase necessary. DTW, void, we're prohibited by law. See terms and conditions 18 plus. Okay, so we're back. Is there anything else that you want to leave with this, with the community to hear, um, as well as a tip or piece of advice that you'd like to share? I would just encourage, um, women everywhere to share the positive parts of their birth story. Um, because the only positive stories that I really received were the ones that I read in books versus the ones that I were told, you know, at the dinner table or over the phone or even from friends and family. Um, so I think, I think sharing how positive and, and beautiful your, your birth experience is, regardless of, of how it is that the birth goes or, or if it results in, um, you know, whether it's, uh, unmedicated or, um, vaginal or C-section, et cetera. I think there, there's just more positivity to share about those experiences. And so I would encourage people to, to, to do so. I a hundred percent agree. And also kind of just taking, taking that edge of everything has to be dramatic and horrible that it could still, it can be beautiful. So, and thank you for sharing yes. your beautiful birth story. I loved hearing about it. I loved getting that video. <laughs> Are you okay that I put it in the show notes? Is that oh, okay yeah, with you? Please, go ahead. <laughs> All right, go ahead. So people listening, I mean, talk about open throat, open vagina. I saw that and I was just Indeed. like, you go. I just, I was so proud of you for being like, you harnessed. It was like this power. It was just like raw power. It's like, I don't know. I had a student one time say that was like her superpower. I just felt like birthing people can really. It is a superpower, but it's one it you is. don't even know you have. It just, it just, it just comes out if you allow it to. Yeah. And you did. So I'm so excited. You're going to let me share that. And I want everyone mm-hmm. to go see it because first of all, if you, <laughs> people also may not know what you look like, you're, you're, and I can say this as a petite person, you're a rather petite person. And then <laughs> to see the, the sound and the movement, it's like you, you just like took up space and you were just like, I am a birthing person and I am moving my body and I am letting sound out and I am owning this. So that was also pretty awesome to see. Oh, Deb, if only you could have seen the birth itself. It was that times 10. <laughs> Yay for you. Yay for you. you need to have, you need to get yourself a t-shirt. I am a superhero. Well, you are a superhero. And I loved that I've gotten to know you Thanks. through this time. And I'm so glad that you're back in postnatal. It's really, it's a joy. It really is. Well, thank you so much for sharing. I'm so glad that we were able to do this. Yes. All right. Be well. I'll see you in class. <laughs> Bye, Deb. This has been an episode of Yoga Birth Babies, produced by Prenatal Yoga Center. You can catch us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Periscope. I'm Deb Flaschenberg. Thanks for listening. With Lucky Land Slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. 
This is your captain speaking. Uh, we've got clear runway and the weather's fine, but we're just gonna circle up here a while and uh, get lucky. No, no, nothing like that. It's just these cash prizes add up quick. So I suggest you sit back, keep your tray table upright, and start getting lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandslots.com. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details.